What Canada Wants by George W. Ross. <clears throat> Canada wants men, not walking monuments, who smirk and smile with art polite and sport the garments of their richer friends, but men full of heart who can plant the standard of their worth on noble deeds and dare respect their conscience and their God. Canada wants honest men, men who shall lay their empire's cornerstone secure upon the solid granite of God's eternal truth and build her towers and all her columns hew from the deep quarry of a nation's love. Canada wants virtuous men, men with their hearts attuned to holiness, men who will take the Bible as their charter of faith, adore the God whom it reveals, and learn with gratitude, sincere, to sound His praise. Canada wants heroic men, men who shall dare to struggle in the solid ranks of truth, to clutch the monster air by the throat, hurl base oppression from her seat, break down her walls, and let the world with songs of universal rapture usher freedom in. Canada wants noble men, not those who trace nobility through torturous channels of hereditary blood and boasting of ancestral worth, but men of noble souls, men tested well in life's great struggle, tempered in the forge of hard experience and fortified against temptation's wiles by purity of heart. Men who, do, who will dare assert their rights to do what God says is right, though all the world would sneer. Now let me read to you what Canada needs. Canada needs her churches to remember that judgment begins at the house of God. She needs Christians who humbly bow the knee in prayer and ask, Is it I, Lord? Have you removed your blessing because of me? Have I lain down the sword of your word for the chains of prosperity, of wealth and acceptance? Have I let things go because I'm tired of the fight? Have I surrendered my kids to the easy road? And should God answer yes, be willing to do whatever He bids us do. Canada needs men of God, not divine dabblers who punch their time card in at the door of the church and then afterward cast off their Creator while they carry on with their greater loves. But men, rather, who lead the way toward righteousness, who dare not point any to a way he would not go himself. Canada needs people of humble prayer, whose strength comes neither from their abilities nor from their resolve, but from God who gives the victory. People whose strength comes in acknowledging their weakness, who fling themselves daily upon the throne of grace for help. Canada, Canada needs families united under God, where dads take their place as protectors and moms apply nurturing care, where both would boldly face down all the host of hell to protect their kids with God Himself as their shield. Canada needs pioneers and trailblazers. Not those seeking fame, fortune, or freedom to live as they please, but those who go where darkness abounds and plant the standard of the cross where Satan hath souls bound. Those who plant churches and seek to save that which was lost, who count the saving of souls worth every earthly loss. Thank you. And ask God to give you a heart for, for Canada.
our souls must start today. We can't expect somebody else to fill our vacant shoes. Please give us, dear Father, as we pray. Lord, give me a heart for this country. Remind me of the debt of love I owe for what is prosperity and power. People may come to our nation and find prosperity, but they need the Lord. It's their greatest need. Eric, can you grab me my bag for me back there? Thank you. Turn to Jeremiah with me, if you would, the book of Jeremiah. Oh, there's lots of things that I probably don't love about my nation. Lots of things I don't love about the way Canada is today. But I love the people of our nation. And I believe that God can still do a work and God can still bring a reviving in this day. And he needs to. Uh, our world, our, our net world's in trouble. Our world is becoming so godless. And uh, we want God to use us to help bring people to the Lord in this day. Thank you. Jeremiah chapter 2. And let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Can we do that? Jeremiah chapter 2. Let me speak to you here briefly this morning about our need for revival, Canada's need for revival. We're going to look to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse beginning there in verse number 1. And we read in Jeremiah of a nation that needed revival. It wasn't the nation of Canada. It was, it was you know, the nation of Israel, Judah. It was God's people. And the God's people and the kingdom and the divided kingdom for many years of, of Israel and Judah, they needed the Lord. They needed revival. At times they had some good kings. At times they followed the Lord and served the Lord and worshipped the Lord. But at times, sadly, they turned away from God. And they worshipped false gods like all the other nations around them. And uh, this was a time in history when Jeremiah the prophet was being used of the Lord to speak and preach and to give the word of the Lord that God's people needed revival. The nations needed revival. And our nation is certainly like that this morning. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 9. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not so. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the firstfruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, say the Lord. And Jeremiah speaks the word of the Lord, but reminds that there was a time when God's people loved him. There was a time when they were living as, as holy unto the Lord and they were living for him and they were remembering him and they loved God like they should. But notice as we read on in verse four, what's what's the people are like now? He says, hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me? He says, what is it? What is it that your forefathers have found in me? Have they found something lacking in me? Have I ever disappointed them? Have I ever hurt them? What is it that they found in me that now they've drifted so far from me? And their love for me is not like it was years ago. 
He says, Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they're gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, and through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a, a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. What happened? Remember, God had brought his people, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. He brought them out of bondage in Egypt and slavery in Egypt and brought them across the wilderness, brought them through the Red Sea and perished the Egyptians behind them that were pursuing them. He brought them through the wilderness, brought them to Canaan land, the promised land that years before God had promised to Abram, to Abraham. He'd make of them a great nation and he'd give them their own land. And God did all of that. God took care of them in the wilderness. God brought them to that land, even after some unbelief on their parts. Eventually, with, with Joshua, would be the one who would lead them in. And they, they, they dwelt in Canaan land. They dwelt in the promised land. And they had it good. And the God who was blessing them and protecting them. And who would defend them from all the other uh, uh, nations around them that opposed them. But somehow, sadly, there were times where their hearts just drifted away from God. The true God, Jehovah God, the God of Israel. And they became like all the other nations around them. And they began to live for vain things. And they took the heritage that God had given them, the Bible said, and they made it an abomination. Notice again verses 7 to 9. But I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, a false god, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask you to speak to our heart this morning. Would you use your word to challenge us? God, as you try to plead with us, Help us to hear you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. In our text, we see a message to the children of Israel during the reign of Josiah. Josiah was Judah's last king. His son Jehoiakim would be an absolute apostate and, and to not go in the way of King David or not go in the way of King Josiah. He would be yet another king who would just lead the nation into the ways of idolatry and to the worshiping of false gods. And they'd, they'd have altars for Baal and they'd have altars for false gods. How sad it is in a nation that God said, I've set you apart as a people unlike any other people in the world. You're my chosen people and I'm going to give you a place that will be all your own. I'm going to make you my people. I'm going to bless you abundantly. God was so good to them. But they took all of that and they were wasting it and they were changing it and they were worshiping false gods. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And Jeremiah was very much a, a man of great passion in his message that he delivered to the um, people of, of, of Israel, the people of Judah, the people of God. And he delivered it, no doubt, with tears. He was a weeping prophet. Acting as on behalf of God, a voice for God, pleading to the people that they would return unto him. Notice here in the first part of the chapter the relationship that there had been between God and Israel. Back in verses 1 to 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness and in a land that was not so. God remembered here the, the kindness of their youth. He remembered their love for God. He remembered Israel's love for God and their kindness to him in their youth, their infancy, if you will, of beginning of his making them a nation and giving them their, their, their own land. You know, there were some men in Canadian history that loved God and loved his word. In that song that was sung there and in some other songs that you heard this morning, we, we mentioned the dominion. This dominion, his dominion. 
officially the name of Canada became the Dominion of Canada. Back when there was a man in the parliament by the name of Sir Robert Tilly that was doing his morning devotions. And it all happened at a time when those in parliament were meeting together and trying to determine what's a good name for the country. And in reading his devotions, in reading the book of Psalms, he read in the Psalms where the Bible says he, referring to God, shall have dominion from sea to sea. He thought, oh, that's good. Boy, we're a nation that spans from sea to sea to sea, and we want God to have dominion in our land. That would be my prayer. And so he went back to Parliament and told them what he read in the Scriptures and suggested, I think we should call it the Dominion of Canada. The Dominion of Canada. They thought, oh, that's a great name. And they decided to name our nation the Dominion of Canada. It was the desire of many of those government leaders that God would have dominion from sea to sea to sea. Now, we may look back today and say perhaps there was some greater days in our infancy and in our youth than there is today. Perhaps back in the infancy of Canada as a nation, there was uh, more of those seemingly, especially in government, that had a love for God or that would be kind towards God or that would think about God or regard God or even want God to be a part of the nation. That is very true, just like it was true with Israel, just like it was true with Judah. Perhaps God looks back and remembers a day when there was more of our politicians and more of our government leaders who loved God and feared God and would have had a desire to honor God. Do you know there was a, a time even in the history of Toronto where Toronto had a nickname of being Toronto the Good? Toronto the good. I mean, there was so many preachers and churches and, and great works and so on. And, and just that it was known as Toronto the good. We couldn't call it Toronto the good anymore. Not at all. We live in a nation and we live in a, a GTA where, where people have forsaken God and turned their hearts away from God and couldn't care less about God. They have no regard for Him. They have no desire to honor God or include God or give Him a special place. And sadly, that's what it was like for the nation of Israel and that's what it's like in our day. So we see Israel's love for God there in verse 2. We, we see Israel's consecration to the Lord and, and their, their holiness unto the Lord in verse number 3 where it says, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. There was a time where, where again, they're, they're being, they're being uh, set apart unto God. They're being holy. They're being consecrated unto the Lord was what was to distinguish them. And it still is, by the way. It has always been true that God has desired for His people to be holy unto the Lord and consecrated unto the Lord. And we're to be set apart from the world so that we can be consecrated unto Christ. And you and I as God's people are to live a life that is very distinct, that is very different from the world. We're to live holy lives. You and I shouldn't be like the world. We shouldn't be involved in the sins and vices of the world. Through Christ, we have power to be able to overcome those things. And we should live lives that make us different from the world, uh, set apart from the world, different from the world. In fact, in the New Testament Scriptures, it even tells us that we should be peculiar people. That means different. The world might think us strange. Listen, if you fit in good with the world and you fit in good with all of your unsaved uh, uh, co-workers and so on and godless uh, co-workers who, who they do ungodly things, then there's something wrong. We're to be different. We're to be thought of as strange. We're to be thought of as being peculiar and different. Why? Because we as God's people are to be holy unto the Lord, living consecrated lives, living set apart lives. God has always desired that His people would come out from the world and be separate from them, be different. And that's what would make us a light unto the world. In the midst of darkness, we're the light. And the nation of Israel, they were to be a nation that they were a light to all the other nations around who did not have the true God, who did not know Jehovah God. And it ought to be true of us today, us who are born again believers and followers of Jesus Christ, that we're a light unto the world, that we are of the truth. We know the one true God. We know the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why we're different. We're to be holy unto Him. Israel had a time where they were holy unto the Lord, consecrated unto the Lord. 
Israel's early days were sort of like a honeymoon spiritually. Oh, they just love the Lord. Right? Uh, he said, I remember the, uh, the, I remember the kindness of the youth. I remember the love of thine espousals. I remember when you went after me. Boy, remember when you were young and in love and how much you wanted to be with that boy or girl that you fell in love with? Boy, and God longs for us to have a day where we're like that again with Him. Where we're in love with Him and we desire Him and we want to be with Him and we want to talk to Him and we want to spend time with Him. And that's what Israel was like in their youth. Oh, it was a honeymoon spiritually. The Bible says in Zechariah 2, 7 and 8, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which, which spoiled you, which turned you aside, which would go in and conquer them and defeat them, and again by the Babylonians be taken captive, and so on. Notice this, For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. It's always been that God said to his people, you're the apple of my eye. You're the one I love. My affection is set on you. My love is set on you. I love you. You're precious to me. You're the apple of my eye. You're my sweetheart. There was a time where God's people understood that and they were loving God like God loved them. You know, there was a day in our nation when God and the Bible and prayer would have been acceptable in our public schools. But now our leaders and ministers of education would rather force strange and wicked sex education curriculum on the students. But then try to say that teaching the Bible and so on is just not allowed because we don't want to offend anyone. We're living in a messed up day, in a messed up world where people can teach all kinds of things, but the Bible can't be taught. Jesus Christ can't be lifted up. They could do Christmas programs and Christmas pageants and so on about all kinds of things, but don't you dare bring Jesus into it. Don't you dare mention Bethlehem and the Savior coming into the world. That wouldn't be, that's not welcome. No place for that. Notice what else we see there in verse 3. Israel's protection by the Lord, where he said, All that devour him shall, shall offend. In other words, those that would try to devour uh, Israel and so on, God was going to defend them. He would always protect his people, and he always did, as long as they sought him. As long as they were seeking to please him and seeking to worship him. But there were times when, because God's people turned their hearts away from God, that God allowed them to be defeated. God allowed them to be overcome and defeated sometimes by other people, by other heathen nations around them, because God wanted to bring them to a place of brokenness so that they'd repent and so that they'd return to God again. So they'd turn their hearts back to Jehovah God and realize, God, we need you. God, we've been foolish. God, our hearts have been turned away. But God has always defended his people and protected his people as long as we sought him. Notice as we go on in these verses, we see the rebellion of Israel. The rebellion of Israel. In verses 5 to 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they're gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are, are become vain. they become vain. They're pursuing things that are just empty and meaningless. They're, they're pursuing now these false gods and worshiping these false gods that can do nothing for them. I'm the true God. I'm the only one that hears prayer. I'm the only one that answers prayer. And now they're offering all those sacrifices to their false gods. What have they ever done for them? What have those idols ever done for them? Nothing. Nothing. I saw a house the other day, again, and it's common in our city, but I, I, I looked with sadness on it where I saw a home, and in the porch there was a statue of Buddha. And I forget what it was. It was something nice if I could have gone in and had it. They, they had left Buddha some, uh, some really nice sweet thing or something. <laughs> Do you know I've seen other times places where that just sits on somebody's porch until the flies have come and infested it. And, you know, or something's just rotten and old. <laughs> Listen, all the false gods have never done anything for anyone. There's one true and living God, one Jehovah, one God that hears us when we pray, one God that can help us. How sad it was when God's people turned to vanity and vain things and false gods. 
and the rebellion. We see that it was unjustified. It was unjustified, their, their turning away. He says, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they're gone far from me? Come on, tell me. What have they found wrong in me? Have I ever tried to hurt them? Did I ever forsake them? Did I ever leave them alone? Did I ever abandon them? Did I ever not help them? No, I've always helped them. Right from Egypt, I brought them out. I brought them through the wilderness. I brought them to Canaan. Land. I helped them in driving out their enemies. Remember what I did at Jericho? When I made the walls fall down? I've never let you down. God says, what? Well, what have your fathers found wrong in me? What, have, what fault have they found in me that they would turn away from me? I don't get it. It's unjustified. What justifies us taking the word of God out of our society or taking the Ten Commandments out of our society? or Nothing. In our national anthem, we still, praise the Lord, sing, God keep our land glorious and free. I wouldn't be surprised if in my lifetime they try to take that right out of the national anthem. But you know what? We'll still sing that national anthem. <laughs> Listen, we need, we need God. The only times nations have been blessed and had it good is when they had God, God protecting their nation and God blessing their nation. And God will bless the nation that seeks the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But sadly, our nation's turning away from God. And our nation can no longer expect the blessings of God or protection of God. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalteth a, a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness is what will exalt a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. They're turning away from the Lord. Their rebellion towards God. It was unjustified. It was, it was unfulfilling. It was unfulfilling. He said, they've gone far from me and they've walked after vanity and have become vain. Now they're just pursuing something that's empty. They can't do anything for them. It's unfulfilling. And I say that sin is always unfulfilling. In Isaiah 44, 9, it said, uh, they, that, uh, they that make a graven image are, are all of them vanity. And their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Anytime people turn away from God, it's all vanity. It's all vain. It's all empty. It'll leave you unfulfilled. And in this day and age when there's such rebellion towards God and such a perversion of, of truth in our society, such a wickedness that's grabbing hold of society and being uh, taught to our children and so on. Listen, may I say that all of it is unfulfilling. Some of the things they're trying to push upon children nowadays and to uh, transgenderism and so on, it's all unfulfilling. They're not going to tell them the stories of the people later with de deep regrets, of the people later that will commit suicide, of the people later that wish they never did that. We're living in a society where, listen, people are pursuing after all kinds of sins and all kinds of selfish pleasures and things that they think will make them happy, but, happy, but it will all leave people unfulfilled. There's never true happiness, never true joy with the gang life, with drugs, with violence, with homosexuality. Teen pregnancies, abortion, divorce rates, so many things. Sin always leaves us unfulfilled. Unfulfilled. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 115, verses 1 to 5. Psalm 115, it says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Ears have they, but they see not. Listen, when people make for themselves their own gods and their own idols and their own statues, those idols can never see them. Those idols don't hear their prayers. Those idols will never help to them. They can pray to them all they want. They can offer incense to them all they want, but it will never help them. Never. Years ago, I went and peeked into the, into the Hindu temple on, on Bayview. And I really didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I've never been in a Hindu temple. Never have. 
And I, I was, I guess, a little surprised. It's probably maybe they've made it nicer now. I know they've worked on a lot over the years. But inside that building, it was like a massive warehouse look to it still at the time when I looked. And there was these massive idols in there. Were places where people could go and pray and offer incense to it, the, the different idols and different gods and so on. Those idols have never done anything. Those idols have never answered prayer. But yet people are in bondage to religion and things that are all just vain and empty. So many people are following so many religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, so prevalent. People are following practices such as witchcraft and Satanism. People are involved in a gothic lifestyle in many things in places of the world. People are into spiritism and Scientology and uh, even yoga and so on as ways of trying to find something in something other than the true God. It's all unprofitable. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 11 to 13. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verses 11 to 13. It says, Hath a nation changed their gods? which are yet no gods. They're just idols. Half the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken waters, uh, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What a comparison he makes as well. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, only to have cisterns and, and so on that can't hold water at all. They can't do anything for them. It's unprofitable. How foolish and unprofitable it is when the nation of Israel and Judah turn to false gods. Sometimes we likewise are so foolish in not realizing how good we have it when we have God. And sometimes we are so uh, uh, even uh, deceived by Satan into thinking that there are things in this world and things that the world has to offer us today that this is what will make us happier, this will, not, will, will bring us pleasure, or this is what will bring us fulfillment in life. But can I say, there's no true fulfillment in life apart from God and apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. What you need, who you need in your life is the Lord Jesus. He is the Son of God. You need Yeshua. You need the Messiah. You need the Savior. You need the Son of God who came and died on the cross and shed His blood and gave His life to pay the penalty for your sin so that you could be brought into a relationship with God. You could be born again and become a child of God. Listen, it's only true, truly, in the God of the Bible, the God of heaven, His Son, Jesus Christ. Only in Him can you find fulfillment and life and satisfaction. And joy and peace and hope. You need Him. What else do we see? It was because they were ungrateful. Look at verses 6 and 7 and we see their ungratefulness. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? That led us through the wilderness, through the lands of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. They became ungrateful. And the book of Romans describes for us people in this generation too who are ungrateful. And because of ungratefulness, we turn away to our perversions and we turn away to our own idols and we turn away to our own gods and we turn away to our own humanism and we turn away to our own just life built completely on self. Ungratefulness has always been at the core of people's forsaking God and rejecting God and having no place for the true God in their life. Ungratefulness. They were ungrateful. They must have forgotten how God brought their forefathers out of Egypt. They must have forgotten all the good things and how he provided water uh, out of the rock for them in the wilderness. They must have forgotten the manna that he fed them with in the wilderness. They must have forgotten how God brought down the walls of Jericho. They must have forgotten how they defeated uh, enemy after enemy and drove them out of the Canaan land so that they could have this inheritance, the land that God promised to them. They must have forgot that God brought them to a place where there was a land flowing with milk and honey. They forgot God's goodness. They forgot all that God had done. They forgot God's blessings. 
they were now disregarding God and God's word. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, we see they were disregarding God's word and just doing what they wanted. The priest said not, where is the Lord? Even the Jewish priests weren't truly seeking after the Lord God anymore. They were a part of all the foolishness and wickedness as well. Condoning, participating. The building of the, the idols and altars to false gods and so on. Offering sacrifices to the false gods. The priest said not, where is the Lord? Uh, they that handled the law, those that were supposed to know the, the law of God and teach the law of God and make sure people were following the law of God and the word of God, they weren't doing that. The pastors also transgressed against me. They weren't preaching the truth. They weren't shepherding the people. It says the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Even those that should have been spiritually leading the way and trying to lead the people to God and keep them in God's word and show them this is what God says and this is what God wants and this is what God will bless. This is what will keep our nation close to God. They weren't doing it. There was no spiritual leadership even. People were disregarding God's word and just doing what they wanted. They forgot God's principles. Listen, Corinthians tells us, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What else do we see about his people here? They became very wicked and backslidden. Look down to verse uh, number 19. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 19. We see they became very wicked and backslidden. It says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. What a tragedy it is that it says about his people, they forsook him. They had forsaken the Lord God. They no longer feared God. The Bible teaches us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They no longer feared God. They were essentially living a lie and not truly fearing God. They maybe had some outward conformings to some of the ways of God, but they were not clean in their heart and pure in their love for the one true God. Notice what it says there in verse 20 to 22. Jeremiah 2, 20 to 22. For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress. He said, there's times in the past where I delivered you, and you said, I'll not transgress. I'll not. But when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot, you're unfaithful to God. You've forsaken God. When you're supposed to be true to God and faithful to God, you're, you're, you're committing spiritual adultery. Verse 21 says, Yet I had planted thee a, a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. Oh, maybe they were still doing some of their things. They were washing their hands. They were keeping themselves clean. They did all kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with that. But their heart was so far from God. They weren't seeking after God. They were worshiping false gods and idols and so on. And they had turned away from God. God says, I know all that. How sad. Notice in verse 31 and 32 that they were neglecting their God. Verse 31 and 32, Jeremiah 2. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord? Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords, we will come no more unto thee. But what a sad day it is when we start to make ourselves the lords of our life. We're in charge. I'm the Lord. I'll decide. And God ceases to be God in your life in a practical way. You're in charge. And notice verse 32, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? You know, you get a, you get a young girl and she's getting ready for a wedding day. You think she's going to forget about her wedding dress? No, probably not. 
But what he says, yet my people have forgotten me days without number. I who should be so precious to you. I who you were in love with. I who, who you're to be a spouse to, married to. You've neglected me. You've forgotten me. Days without end. You haven't spoken to me. You haven't talked to me. Are we ever like that? Do we go days without ever speaking to God? Do we go days without ever listening to God and opening up His Word and reading it and God speak to me? God speak to me. I need to hear from you. Do we go days without end where we don't speak to God, we don't listen to God, we don't read our Bible? Oh, you need to take time for God. Christian, take time for God. Open up His Word. Ask Him to speak to you. Listen to His voice. Listen to the voice, if you're saved, of the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you and wants to teach you His way. Be in church. Seek to hear from God. Seek to hear what God's Word says. Listen, make sure you're not neglecting God in your life. We can't truly say we love God if we're neglecting Him day after day after day. Go back to verse number 14. They were neglecting God. And sadly, I fear that we do the same thing many times. I want you to notice that because of the way they were behaving, they lost God's protection as a nation. Because they forsook God, they were losing His protection and blessing and so on. In verse 14, it says, There came a messenger. I apologize. My Bible changed. Here we go. Jeremiah 2, 14. Is Israel a servant? Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Has he become a slave now? Why is he spoiled? Why, why has he been spoiled? Why has he been defeated by these enemy nations and enemy peoples all around? And now they're, they're being like slaves. Why have they been taken away captive to Babylon? Why all this? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. And the, also the children of Noth and uh, Tehaphanes have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procur procured this unto thyself? And that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way. He says, you want to know why at times I've allowed my enemies to defeat you? You want to know why you've been taken away into captivity in Babylon? You want to know why these things have happened? Because you procured it. You brought it upon yourself. Because you forsook me. You turned away from me. You said, I don't need you, God. I'll have my other gods, thank you. I've got my false gods. I've got my idols. And whenever we forsake God... How can we stand there and say, God, you protect us. God, you bless us. No, you, you got no right to expect that. They were bringing it upon themselves. I want you to see quickly here the restoration of a nation. The restoration of a nation. How can a nation be restored to God? Look back to verse 9. How can a nation be restored to God? In verse 9, he said, Wherefore... And Jeremiah speaking as the voice of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. This is what God is saying to the people. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. And with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and Sea and send unto Kedar. And consider diligently. Consider diligently. And see if there be such a thing. The Bible says in the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so also, so also shall the son of man be to this generation. Who is blessed? Those that hear the word of God and obey it. Who does God bless? Those that are seeking after Him and following Him. Who does God bless? He blesses a nation whose God is the Lord. He blesses a nation, a nation where they seek to be righteous and to please God and to do what His Word says. Righteousness exalteth a nation. 
Our nation has no right to think, well, we should have this special place amongst the nations. No. If we forsake God, our nation will become worse and worse and worse. And more wicked and more wicked and more wicked. And God just steps back and, I'm not going to protect you. I'm not going to bless you. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been destroyed. God is pleading today. God is still pleading today. He's pleading, of course, for lost souls to come to him and trust him. Well, the revelation says, behold, I, I stand at the door and knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open unto me, I will come in. But God is also pleading to those who do know the Lord. You've been saved. You've been born again. You are God's child. He's pleading to you as well. And to God's people, God is pleading with you. And he's saying, repent. Return unto me. Return unto my word. Follow me. I want you to be consecrated and holy unto me. Different from the world. I've called you out of the world. If your love for God has not been what it ought to be, God is calling for you and pleading with you to repent and return unto Him. If your love for sin and self in the world has been growing, then repent and return and run back to God because He's, he's pleading for you. Come to me. Come to me. Turn back to me. We need to resist the lure of Satan. You know, I'm sure glad that no matter how unfaithful we've been to him, he still loves us and he longs for our return. He longs for our return. In verse 13, there had been some people in Judah who wanted a plurality of gods, and so they embraced these false religions and these false gods. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 44 and verse 9, that they that make a graven image are, are all, uh, all of them vanity. Vanity. And their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know. They, they may be ashamed. They may be ashamed. Again, Corinthians tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You and I are to be God's people in this world. You and I are to be light in the midst of the darkness all around us. You and I must return unto God and love God and serve God with all our heart. The only hope for revival in a nation is for God's people to be what we ought to be. The scriptures tell us that judgment must begin at the house of God. We would like to sometimes stand here and think, boy, if I could just be a judge in Canada and clean up all the mess. Well, judgment needs to begin right here. It needs to begin with me. Am I the person of God that I ought to be? Am I the Christian that God wants me to be? Am I the child of God that he wants me to be? Am I the pastor that God wants me to be? And you must judge it yourself. Start with yourself. And run to God. If you've never turned to the true God, accept God, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You need to do that. But if you know you're already saved and you know your maybe love for God is not what it ought to be. Maybe in the infancy of your Christian life or in the youth of your Christian life, you loved God more than you do now. You were more consecrated to God than you are now. You were more concerned and faithful to the things of God than you are now. Listen, get back to God. Return to God. Run to God. That's our only hope for revival. You know, with Satan, it, it doesn't really matter who or what a person believes in as long as they just don't believe in God. And he doesn't really care who or what you love as long as you just don't love God like you should. It's really true. Satan doesn't care what you love. He just doesn't want you to love God. And if you become like this world, just wrapped up in yourself with a focus on self and a love of pleasure and a love of sin and a love for self, he's okay with that. We need to run to God. We need to return to God. Our nation can only be great if we follow the truth of God's word. 
If we will take the truth of God's word and we'll heed it and we'll obey it and we'll follow it, then we can see God's restoring power. We can see God bring revival. We can see God do great things. But if we reject the truth of the word of God, then we will suffer the fate of other spiritually rebellious societies and nations. And we will hasten the judgment of God. The only thing that will delay the judgment of God is God's people living righteously. God's people being the salt of the earth and light of the world that we're supposed to be. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is the reproach of any people. Will our nation become a reproach and a shame in the world? It sure will, if we keep turning away from God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Can we pray like some of our uh, people in Parliament in the early days thought? Oh, I, I want God to have dominion from sea to sea to sea. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, convict us, Lord, of sin in our life. Convict us, Lord, of areas of our life where we've not loved you like we should. Convict us, Lord, if we've been neglecting you. Convict us, Lord, if we've not been making your word and your church a priority in our life. Convict us, Lord, if we've not been faithful. Convict us, Lord, if we've not been taking time to pray every day. Convict us, Lord, if we've not been reading our Bible and meditating on God's word every day. Father, we know the way to blessing. We know the way to your protection. We, we know the way to have a blessed life and to see our nation be changed. But it starts with you, God. Father, I don't want our families to be ashamed. I don't want any Christian to be ashamed. Even at the judgment seat of Christ. God, help us if we've never received you and received your son as our personal savior to realize that it's a decision and a choice we must make. God, you love the whole world. You sent your son to die for the whole world. But if someone here has never personally chosen to believe on you and receive your son, Jesus Christ, as their personal savior, then they will be lost. They must make a decision. They must make a choice. And Father, help those who have already made that choice to be wholehearted in their consecration and living for God. Wholehearted in their seeking to live a holy life that is set apart unto God, that's pleasing to God, that's different from the world, that stands out like light in darkness. God, help us not to neglect you. Help us not to live a life of self. Help us not to be uh, humanistic, Lord. Help us not to turn to false gods and idols and different things. Help no, no one here ever to turn away from the faith. Father, help everyone to know that there's truly only one God and one Savior. One way of salvation. One hope. One faith. One Lord. Father, I pray that people would have their faith in you and in your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to follow you with all of our heart. To love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Keep us from frivolous things. Keep us from foolish things. Keep us from just things that may catch our fancy and, and then distract us and deter us. And keep us from loving God like we should. God, help us to judge ourselves and, and make sure that we are getting ourselves right with the Lord and walking with the Lord and living for the Lord. We know it's our nation's only hope for revival. Convict us, Lord, please. As the pianist plays, would you just ask the Lord to help you to love God like you should? Would you ask God to help you to obey his word like you should? Would you 
ask God to help you to spend time in prayer each day. Ask God to convict you and remind you to pick up his word and read it and meditate on it every day. Make it precious to you. Don't let it be that it's something you set aside and then have to search for on the next Sunday to bring with you to church. Let it be the most precious book in your life. Ask God to help you to love the truth and stand for the truth and be salt in the, in the, in the earth. Be light in the world. Be different. Ask God to help you to love him with a first love. Like he's your sweetheart. Your precious savior, your dearest friend. You don't want to grow distant or cold in your love for God. Father, help us today, please. We so much need to turn our hearts to you. Forgive us of our foolishness and sinfulness and neglect of you, God. Help us to walk intimately and closely with you and fellowship with you and seek to obey you in all things.